Hi everyone, Coach DiBernardo here. I just want to put together this video for you guys about game model construction. Also, how a game model could inhibit your player's freedom and restrict them a little bit so they're not able to perform at their highest level. And I also wanted to show a little bit about Pep Guardiola's positional grid, 4-3-3, uh, 3-5-2, uh, uh, how these things can be coached, how positional play comes into this figure, and also maybe how does this all translate over into your daily training sessions. So if we look right here, this grid is a general framework of ideas. That's how I want you to look at it. I don't want you to look at it as if the ball is in this section, this is what the player has to do, right? I want to leave that freedom for the player to figure out what the best solution for them is based upon the general framework of how we play, right? And so it's very flexible. And by being very flexible, it allows players to use maybe their unique skill sets that they have. So if we take a look at the exact grid here, in the middle of the field here, it's the fast area, right? A one-touch area, a two-touch area. Um, players can play wide or they can play penetrating balls through into the box where obviously a very dangerous area for the ball to be in, right? In the middle of that field. Also, if you have a target forward, you could play balls into to them to knock it down right in front of the box where you press and win it and try to score right away. Dribbling is actually a pretty low percentage in on top of the box in that middle area because that's usually where the most amount of players are located. Now these little half spaces, it's labeled penetrating ball or playing passes out wide or even shooting to the far post from this half space. The half space area is located in those two spaces um, outside of the central area on top of the box. So if we basically Ariel Robin and you look at um, Messi, they love to get those balls in the half spaces because they could hook it to the far post and, and they score a lot of goals from there from penetrating in. Now, the half spaces are great because you could still slide those penetrating balls through into the middle of the box for a striker to finish or wherever to finish. And obviously you could still play the ball out wide. So those are the half spaces located on the side, um, right on top of the box, but out wide on top of the box. Then if you look at the low percentage area, obviously people don't really look at this as a low percentage area, but for me, this is a low percentage area. The chance of scoring from the ball totally out wide like that is not a high percentage. So we wanna say, what do you do from, from that type of an area? And obviously you could just whack crosses into the box, which is not necessarily my preferred option for there, especially if the defense is already set and, and already in place. So it depends though, if the line is higher and you drive into that low percentage area, can you drive the end line? Can you hit that ball back um, towards the six yard line for someone to finish or even a near post run for someone to finish? We'll talk about that low percentage area in there but my general idea about the low percentage area is most players think, hey, I got the ball deep and wide. I have to cross the ball. You don't have to cross the ball. And then if you look at that last area, which is just behind the low percentage area out wide, it depends. If the, if the defense is holding a high line, then maybe a ball to the, to, you know, in and behind them to, to, the, to the back of the defense, to the far post, it could be a great ball. Um, maybe it's a ball on the ground to a, to a striker or attacking center mid who's penetrating the box. Sure. Maybe it's, Hey, we're going to keep it for five or six passes out here, draw the defense over, and then we're going to hit them on the, on the weak side on the other side of the field where there's more space. So those are a little bit of the zones of the field. And that gives you a general framework. And these, these ideas can be adjusted depending on who you're playing and where the vulnerabilities are of the other team. Now, say you're in a 3-5-2 formation. Basically, the, the structure of your team is going to be just a little bit different than if you were in a 4-3-3 with the ball 
in the same area of the field. And all I want you to do is, none of this is set in stone. You're going to have to figure out different movement patterns that you really like and teach those to the team. But when you teach them to the team, it's not teaching like an American football play. It's just providing them with ideas and also making them aware, hey, when we're in this position, here's the benefits of it if we're positioned this way. Also, are we defensively protected if we give up the ball? And then you want players to realize and start to think about these things themselves because soccer is such a random game. You can't teach possibly every situation. The players are not going to remember that. What you want to teach is their ability to analyze the game because it's up to them once they're on the field. No matter how many situations you practice, you can't guarantee that they're going to absorb all those situations and, and, and instantly put them into, into play. Soccer is a non-stop moving game that requires non-stop problem-solving soccer intelligence on all the players' parts. So again, if we look at this, this might be a way that a 3-5-2 is shaped, and we're going to take a look at a 4-3-3 and how that would differ just a tiny bit. So you could see the difference in a 4-3-3 with the ball in the same area. Now I, I put that red circle around um, the attacking center mid because notice there's not two strikers on top of the box now. And if you notice that right the right wing back is now occupying an inside lane as the winger stays wide, just like we had in the 3-5-2, but it's the this attacking center mid in red now is really the difference. Now, that attacking center mid can now surge forward on a run if he had to. Um, it's just a little bit of difference in the way that the players are organized on the field in a 3-5-2 compared to a 4-3-3 with the ball in the same position with the same game model, the same grid, the same general ideas, but now there's just a little variation in players because of the formation you're playing. Now we take positional play and we add that to this positional grid, the game model, and all this, and this is why soccer intelligence is so important. So let's start with positional play. If you look at the red circle right now, say this winger is up against a slow defender, and he knows that he can dribble by that defender no problem whatsoever. That is a positional superiority. It's a mismatch. So take advantage of the mismatch if it's on, right? Now, if you look at the bigger pink circle, Maybe there's only three defenders, two defenders against four. 4v3, 4v2, whatever it is. Maybe it's 3v2 in that little area. That's a numerical superiority that was created in that area of the field. So if you feel you could take advantage of that, great, take advantage of that. If you see the little red arrow on the striker, Maybe that striker now pulls out into this space in between the lines. Maybe the center back has to go with that striker, and that opens up a space maybe for a little one-two combination with the striker and the winger, and they exploit that space because the striker moved in between the lines. And moving in, in between the lines creates a situation of superiority. Next. If you see um, possibly this striker with the blue around, maybe that striker is six foot four, right? So maybe we use the red circle superiority, dribbles by the defender because there's a big difference there. It's a mismatch. Now that ball comes in, maybe in the air, because this striker is six foot four, and we take advantage of that superiority, right? We, there's, there's all other superiorities as well. If, say for example, there's a combination play with the, with the winger, winger drives the end line, well, the far side winger with that yellow arrow could take off late and fast. And because they took off late and fast, they're exploiting that space behind the defense where they can get in and score on the back post. That is a superiority of speed. 
And the speed doesn't necessarily have to be all physical speed. It could be because of the decision making, right? They took advantage of that speed of thought. So when we talk about positional play and the search for superiorities, I just gave you about four or five ideas of superiorities in positional play that's coming from this framework of a game model in a positional grid. You could also look at other things again, like clipping the ball into this the target striker in blue, where you use the superiority of height to knock down a ball to the attacking center mid or whoever's behind, and you continue with the attack. Now the last connection that needs to be made is how do you take the ideas that we just talked about and implement them into your daily trainings? And this doesn't just go for a team training session. Let's start to think about this if you're a supplemental trainer and you're working 1v1, working in small groups, but they're part of a bigger team and you kind of know the game model that they fit into. Do you start to customize your sessions with these factors in mind? Um, and obviously age group is a huge um, decision in this. Obviously you're going to train a, you know, a U18 team differently than you're going to train your U10 or your U8s or whatever it is. All this is coming in the next video. I appreciate you watching. Take care of yourself.